Good morning, Gospel of Grace Community Church. It's a pleasure, as always, to be here with you, to be able to worship our God. This week, we start the celebration, the solemn celebration of uh, remembering when Jesus was accused and then um, eventually executed on the cross. He died on the cross, but then he didn't, as everyone else, he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And so today we start with Palm Sunday, and we will continue our celebration uh, on Friday. We will have Good Friday, and we will meet together here, not in the community center, here at 7 p.m., and uh, remember uh, Jesus' death on the cross. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, next Sunday, we'll meet here at the same time, 1030, and uh, celebrate his resurrection, the whole point of uh, why we gather here, because Jesus rose and because he proved that he was not only uh, human, 100% human, but also 100% God. He was able to um, do that as a sovereign, uh, all-powerful, omniscient God, and in in doing so, he gives us uh, the salvation and saves us from our sins, something we can never do ourselves, something we never do with our good works. So again, just a reminder, um, Friday we're going to be meeting uh, at 7 p.m. here, and we will also have communion during that service. Um, The rest of the announcements you can read. I won't go over them. They're in the bulletin. So if you're willing and able, please stand with me as I uh, read for our call to worship, Psalm 118 starting with verse 22. Psalm 118, 22. A stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Please, O Lord, do save us. Please, O Lord, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice to the horns of the altar with cords. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy is everlasting. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for creating us, for creating this whole universe, and uh, for giving us the choice that we unfortunately took the wrong choice, each one of us, and decided to go against you, Lord. And uh, But you didn't leave us in that state, but you came and you saved us, and you did that through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We read about you in the Psalms and your sovereign, wonderful plan of using Jesus as that cornerstone on which you have built your church, Lord. We thank you for making this plan of salvation and executing it, putting it into plan, Lord. And we thank you that you have called each one of us, that you have that um, have listened to your call, have responded, and have given our lives to you, Lord. I pray that you would bless this service. I would pr- uh, pray especially for people who are here who do not yet know you, who um, haven't, maybe don't know the, your plan of salvation, or if they do know it, they, you have not, they have not made that step, Lord. I pray that you would open the heart of each one of those people that hear this prayer that are here today, Lord. I pray that you would uh, bless the reading of your word, the uh, exposition of your word, and um, the singing, Lord, as we praise you, as we procro- proclaim the gospel, even in the songs that we sing, Lord. Um, I pray that you would do this all in your name and be glorified in everything. Amen. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began every star and every planet been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. 
with a shout you rose victorious, wresting victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own, from each tribe and tongue and nation. You are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the lands. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry. Oh, 
worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or as we continue to read consecutively through the New Testament, we are in Mark chapter 4. So if you'll follow along as I read, beginning in verse 1, God's word says, He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it out, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers 
along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing, they may not see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you understand this parable? How will you... Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it, and bear fruit, thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying to them, A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, Take care that you listen by your standard to measure of measure it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward, please. Let's pray. Lord, your glory, it fills the heavens, and we praise you because you have revealed the mystery of the kingdom to us. We once were in darkness and ignorant of who you are. We blindly followed the ways of the world, thinking that we were wise and we were satisfied with the the little trinkets that it has to offer us. But in your grace, you have given us eyes to see the deception of our own heart and how it goes after selfish and wicked things, things that are ultimately harmful for us. You have shown us the truth and given us understanding that your ways are right. Your ways are satisfying and they are good. They nourish our souls and they, they give us comfort and hope and purpose. And Lord, our purpose this morning is to worship you. For you are great and mighty and worthy of all praise. And so please... Meet with us here this morning. Fill our hearts with love for you that will carry us through the week and cause us to give off the fragrance of life to those whom we come in contact with. As we look ahead towards Easter next week, we ask that you would help us to remember the great sacrifice that you made to redeem us from slavery to sin and to help us to grow in our hatred for sin. Not to look back as as though we have given up something, but to rejoice that we have been freed from sin's hold on us. That we have been made one of your people, adopted into your family. Lord, help us to to grow in, in righteousness, to desire to be more like you. You have saved us so that we would be transformed into your image. And it would be for your glory's sake. And so continue to do that work in us. Lord, thank you for our church and for the work that you're doing here. We thank you for the youth conference that we were able to go to yesterday. Thank you for the the clear proclamation of biblical truth. And we ask that you would cause that truth to take root in the hearts of our teens, that they would truly know you as Lord. We thank you for the the men's study yesterday. 
uh, for the women's studies that, that meet throughout the week and for the young adult studies and for Friday night. So many opportunities to be fed biblical truth. This is a grace from you, Lord. We are not entitled to your word, but you have chosen to reveal it and to give people the ability to explain and apply it to our lives so that we may grow in you. So thank you for the many opportunities that we have each week to to be in fellowship with like-minded believers, to hear from your word. And thank you that you, you give us each individual copies. We probably have multiple copies on our shelves. We have digital copies. We have such availability to your word. Thank you for that, that grace, that blessing. And please help us to, to read and study. Help us not to take those opportunities for granted. And we are extremely rich in, in our access to biblical truth. But we also pray for those in places in the world where they don't have the opportunities that we do. They don't have individual copies of the scriptures or they're not free to meet freely or often because of persecution. So we ask that you would strengthen our our brothers and sisters in other places in the world, that you would encourage them, protect them, grant that they would have access to the full counsel of your word, that they would come to a, a mature faith. We pray for those in our body that maybe are sick or or struggling this morning. We ask that you would minister to them, that you would strengthen their bodies and and bring about healing, that you would intervene in situations that that might be causing them distress. May they draw their comfort and their confidence and their, their hope from you. And Lord, we pray for our service. We thank you for the great truths that we have been reminded of as we have sung your praises. We ask that you would prepare our hearts for the preaching of your word and help them to be soft soil that is receptive and that applies what we hear. And as we take up our offering, we we thank you for the abundance of generosity that you have provided for us. It is an act of worship to give a portion of that back to you. And so we ask that you would receive it and that you would use it for your glory's sake. Amen. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise. Father of glorious, for all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, burn on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. And thy people bless and give thy word success, spirit of holiness on us descend. All glory be to the Father, all glory be to the Son, all glory be to the Spirit, the blessed three in one.
Please come up front. In John 3, 16, verse, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we read, For God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge, but for the world, Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So this is a reminder for those, for all the sinners, really, and for, for us, those who to believe. To believe in the Lord and King, Lord Jesus, in order to be saved. For us not to perish in eternity. In eternal separation from the Lord, from God, from the Holy God, Christ accomplished our salvation. And it, all it takes, all it takes is for us to believe. Why for some is so hard to believe in, Je in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? It takes the supernatural power of the Lord to regenerate and transform our hearts. So we praise him for those of us who believe, who have this, who has this faith. And we pray that the Lord would give and grant those who are not, who still not, um, who still in rebellious and do not believe into him as Lord and Savior. So we've learned with children a new song with simple faith. And you're welcome to sing with us.
Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I think it goes well with the previous one. Another reminder that anyone is able, anyone is free to come to the Lord with, with our burdens and weariness. With our sin, that's the I think that's the heaviest burden on our on our I think on our nature as as sinful men, fallen 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 humanity. And we're remembering our Lord and King entering in Jerusalem today. Uh, and some of some of the people were greeting him as the king of this earthly kingdom. But he's he's not from this world. His kingdom is heavenly kingdom and in the last verse, we we are challenged to trade all this worldly kingdom for the sake of heavenly kingdom. So again, that's another reminder for our soul. Come on to Jesus, all you who are we. Come to the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Here bring your wounded hearts, broken and needy. Come unto Jesus, mighty to heal. Joy of the comfortless, light for the stray. Thank you. 
Lay down your burdens. He is enough. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. We rejoice today with every Christ church who is celebrating today how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem to fulfill his mission of saving his people. Today, we are celebrating Palm Sunday, and I want to congratulate all of you. And for today, I think it's important for us to consider the significance of, of this event. And so we're going to look at a passage from the Old Testament and see why historically this event, this day, has been celebrated all around the world by all Christians in all generations. In Jesus' earthly mission, his final entrance into Jerusalem is recorded by all four gospel writers. Each gospel writer records his final entrance in his earthly ministry into Jerusalem. Why? Well, because this event, it marked the beginning of what we call the, his Passion Week. The week where Jesus will take upon himself the sin and the, the guilt of mankind and, and then die paying the penalty for violating God's holiness, bearing the wrath of God so that he could then impute his perfect righteousness to all who put their trust in him. And before we look at why this event is famously known as Palm Sunday, I'd like to point out that the gospel writers, they uh, they recording this event, they state that Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, it fulfilled a prophecy that was recorded by Zechariah about 520 years before Jesus even came to this world. And I'd like for us to go back to that prophecy. I'd like for us to look at it and consider the significance of it. So please open your Bibles to Zechariah. Go back in the Old Testament, go back to Zechariah. We're going to look at chapter 9, Zechariah chapter 9, and we'll exposit only one verse, verse 9. So Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. God is always faithful to his promises. We're about to see that he promised Israel an eternal king who would bring salvation to his people. Let's go ahead and read our text, Zechariah chapter 9, just one verse, verse 9. God, speaking through Zechariah to the Israelites, said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Here the prophet Zechariah speaks God's word to Israel. And throughout Zechariah's prophecy, he is tasked to report God's word to Israel of how he will judge them for their sins. The Israelites have sinned and God is pronouncing judgment on the Israelites. And then he also mentions to them how he will bring their restoration. He will bring about their restoration. And so the major theme of Zechariah is... Do not be like your former fathers. Do not be like your former fathers. And he mentions the need for Israel to repent. He does so in chapters 1, chapter 7, chapter 8. And then in chapters 
9 through 14, he emphasizes that Yahweh, he's sovereign over every nation, over all, the whole world, and that there's a future restoration of Israel that's coming. And so our text that we find today is located right in this section where Zechariah reveals to Israel that Yahweh remembers his covenants. He remembers his covenants and he will grant them this blessing of a Messiah, a king who will come and who will bring eternal salvation. Now, this passage is important for us today because it explains God's plan of salvation for His church, for us. This passage explains to us that it necessitated Jesus, Israel's promised king, to arrive in Jerusalem so He could save His people from their sins. This was always part of God's plan. And I'd like to first highlight how God's people are to view the arrival of the king. And then we will look at his attributes. And then we will shift to Gospel of John, chapter 12. And we'll look at a few verses and see why today is significant as Palm Sunday. So, first of all, I want us to notice here in verse 9 the two parallel statements. Now, this is... You know, Hebrew um, poetry, Hebrew way of, of emphasizing things. And notice these two statements. In verse 9, Zechariah reports from God saying to the Israelites, Rejoice greatly and shout in triumph. Rejoice greatly and shout in triumph. Now these statements, they don't just exhort people to be happy. no. Uh, this is an exhortation to have an outburst of excitement. This is a call for this euphoric joy that needs to be expressed with a loud shout. Shout in triumph. God's people are going to be triumphant. Now despite the bondage, despite the oppression that they have experienced, they're told there's a day coming. A day coming when they'll have victory. Now notice the next two parallel statements in verse 9. O daughter of Zion. And then there's also this clause, O daughter of Jerusalem. O daughter of Zion and O daughter of Jerusalem. Two parallel statements meaning the exact same thing because Zion was the holy hill where the temple was built in Jerusalem. Daughter of Zion, the daughter of Jerusalem, refer to the exact same place. And these clauses, these two clauses, daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem, they personified Israel's capital as a young woman. A young woman. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, they're instructed by God to rejoice as a bride of on her wedding day, rejoices when she sees her groom coming. God promised that Jerusalem will be the political capital of the Messiah's kingdom. He spoke about this in other places of the Old Testament. For example, Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 17, speaking of the future Messiah's reign... Jeremiah, speaking from God, says, At that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations will be gathered to it. Where? To Jerusalem. Why? For the name of the Lord. Nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of their evil heart. That was Jeremiah. And now again in Zechariah. God revealed that a day is coming when all the people of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they will audibly rejoice in triumph. Why? Why should Jerusalem rejoice? Well, look again at our text, 
Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah says, Behold, your king is coming to you. <laughs> this word behold, it's an important word. It, it sets the tone for the amazing spectacle. Behold, get ready, pay attention. And then this promise of your king is coming to you. Oh, it was this promise, it gave the Jerusalemites this assurance that the promised Messiah who was promised from beginning of Scripture, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and on, he is coming. He will arrive one day in Jerusalem. And this prophetic statement, it is in harmony with Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, where God said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. The coming Messiah would fulfill the Davidic covenant where God said to David, recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, God promised David, he said, when your days are complete, when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. And throughout history, many foreign kings, they, they conquered Israel. They, they passed through Jerusalem, but none of those kings could ever be Israel's true king. You see, only a descendant of David, only he could rightfully have this, this privilege, this, this opportunity to reign over God's chosen nation. And as Moses commanded the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 15, saying, You shall surely set a king over you whom Yahweh, your God, chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not... Put a foreigner over yourself who is not your brother. And so the Israelites, they, they knew that it had to be an Israelite, one from the lineage of David, one from the tribe of Judah. Only he could be their true eternal king. And so the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they were expecting not just any ruler. No, they were expecting their Messiah who would establish his who will establish his kingdom forever. And the fact that Zechariah says in verse 9, he is coming to you. This is also significant because it indicates that unlike other kings who pursue their own personal gain, who, who come for the purpose of gaining their own pleasure. No, 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 no. This Messiah, he, this king, he will come for the benefit of his people. He's coming to you. He's coming to benefit his people. He's going to bring a great blessing. Well, what would this king be like? God revealed through Zechariah that the Messiah would be distinctively different. Look again at verse 9, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And notice, we see here first that he is just. He is just. And the first description of his virtues is that he will be just. Just in every part of his reign. There will be no injustice in him. Isaiah Chapter 53, verse 11, he says that the Messiah will be known as the righteous one. He will be known as the righteous one. 
So unlike the pagan leaders who are wicked, pagan leaders who are cruel, no, the Messiah, he is going to be righteous. He is going to rule with moral purity. He will render perfect justice to everyone. He will reign with divine wisdom. He will reign with goodness and truth. He will, fu will fulfill Yahweh's ideal design for a king, which recorded in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 5 says, Righteousness will be the belt about his loins. Faithfulness, the belt about his waist. And so as the Messiah, he will take vengeance on all of God's enemies who rebelled against him, who rebelled against his holiness, who violated his law, who didn't repent, who didn't submit to him as Lord. As a just king, he will bless those who are obedient and he will punish those who are rebellious. There will be no sin that is left unpunished. He is just. Moreover, returning back to our text, Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9, here we see that unlike other worldly kings who terrorize and oppress others, we see that the Messiah, he is coming, being endowed with salvation. Endowed with salvation. Even if some earthly king was just. I'll just hypothetically imagine that. An earthly king being just, even if there was such a thing, he could never protect the people that belong to his king kingdom from the injustice of others. But the Messiah, but the Messiah, he is endowed with salvation. He is sovereign to free his people from Satan, from sin, and even from God's judgment. He will save his people from eternal death. He will give his people eternal life, eternal bliss, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more crying. He brings that. He is able to endow that to his people. Now, he will be able to save because it was always God's plan before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, for him to live a perfect life and then to suffer under God's wrath for believing sinners so that he could impute to his people his perfect righteousness. It was always part of God's plan. And so he, he won't merely just pardon sinners by ignoring their sins. No, he will justify them by bearing their guilt on himself. And therefore, the Messiah, he, he can save his people, he can forgive his people, and he can remain just. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1 it reveals God's proclamation. Isaiah there writes, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Notice here that Israel's promised king... He was always intended to be the just king of all the people from all the nations. Israel's king is the king of all the people of all the nations. Well, what else does Zechariah reveal about the Messiah's arrival in Jerusalem? Well, look again at how verse 9 ends. Zechariah 9, verse 9, look how it ends. We read that he will arrive humble, humble, and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Unlike other conquerors, 
The Messiah would not even ride in on a horse. No, he will ride in humbly on a donkey. Now, it's true that in history at one point, even royalty, princes, and sometimes even kings back in the old history, they rode on donkeys. It's true. However, if we follow history, if we study that, we see that by the time of King Solomon, the import and the export of horses made the horse the animal of choice for royalty. Kings preferred horses. They were faster. They were stronger. It was more luxurious. Remember when Israel was in captivity to the media Persian Empire? Ahasuerus, according to Esther chapter 6, verse 11, he ordered Haman to honor Mordecai by taking him through the streets riding on a horse. Jesus arriving to Jerusalem on a donkey. It was not impressive. It was intended to show the Messiah's virtue of humility. Zechariah says that he's humble riding on a don donkey. The reason he's riding on a donkey is because he's showing his humility. There's also other significance of, of him riding on a donkey. And that is that it fulfills Jacob's blessing of Judah. Remember in Genesis chapter 49, right before Jacob dies, he calls his sons and he, he gives them blessings or future prophecy of what's going to happen to them. And there in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10 and 11, when he gets to Judah, when Judah comes, he prophesied to Judah that his descendant will be Shiloh. Judah's descent, descendant will be Shiloh who will rule all the people. Shiloh will rule all the people. And there it says that the Messiah is described to be riding on a donkey's colt. The Messiah is described as riding on a donkey's colt. It's always in line with God's plan. God has a plan. He's fulfilling it. Everything lines up perfectly. You see his foreknowledge, his sovereignty, his control over all events that take place and how he could accurately foretell exactly what's going to happen. Well, Zechariah emphasizes that the Messiah will be humble. And the Messiah's humility... It shows that he will be accessible to all of his people. Think about that. Think about it. There won't be a single person in his kingdom who may not enter his presence. Proud kings, they guard themselves. Humble king, the humble Messiah, he will be accessible to all the people. He will hear every plea. He will stretch out his hands to all the needy. The eternal king will be sympathetic, sympathetic to all of his people. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 tells us that he's our sympathetic priest. He is king, prophet, priest. He is our Messiah. And this shocking description of the coming Messiah, in verse 9, it also depicts him bringing salvation not through might, not through force, not with a sword, but he will bring salvation through self-sacrifice, dying humbly. And this is in line with Isaiah 53, chapter 53, verse 4, which also confirms that he would be a suffering servant who will bear our griefs and sorrows. 
he will bear our griefs and sorrows. And through his afflictions, through the betrayal and his death, Jesus, he will save his people. This was not what Zechariah's original audience wanted to hear. It's not what they expected as far as the entrance of their Messiah. They were thinking, how can this be, this triumphant entry of, the, of their king, how can it include humiliation and suffering? Those things did not go together in their minds. But I want you to notice here that the prophet Zechariah foretold the inhabitants of Jerusalem that a day is coming when their righteous king would enter humbly, riding on a donkey. That was their sign that he's the one. He will ride in on a donkey. Well, now that we have exposited Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, this passage, let's see why Christians celebrate today as Palm Sunday. Why is this day known as Palm Sunday? And even though all four gospel writers record this event, record Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem 500 years after Zechariah made that prophecy, I'd like for us to briefly look at Gospel of John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. Gospel of John chapter 12. Turn in your Bibles, if you can, to John chapter 12. Gospel of John chapter 12. And we will read four verses, verses 12 through 15. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At the end of Jesus' perfect life, at the beginning of Israel's Passover, on the first day of that week, which was the 10th day of the Jewish month, Nisan, when the Pascha lamb was, was supposed to be set apart and kept until the evening of the 14th day when the lamb would be then killed by the Israelites, on that Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem. Now, the Jewish Passover, this was a feast of celebration of how Yahweh delivered them, his people, how he delivered them from the bondage by, by killing Egypt's firstborns and then sparing the Israelites through the blood of a lamb. And that Old Testament event... It foreshadowed the Messiah's deliverance of the church when he, the Lamb of God, would shed his own blood. Now, in, in John chapter 12, verse 12, we read that people, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and we read that a large crowd gathered, growing in, this, in excitement, they were getting ready to welcome him. Now, why were they excited? Well, they were excited because if you look just a few verses down, verse 17 and 18, we see here that they heard of Jesus' miracles that he was performing, including him raising Lazarus from the dead. This just happened recently. They heard about it. They wanted to see Jesus. Well, how did Jesus enter Jerusalem? Our text, verse 14 says, that he sat and rode in on a young donkey, <laughs> just as Zechariah foretold, just as Jacob prophesied to Judah, the Messiah entered Jerusalem humbly 
on a donkey to accomplish the salvation of his people. And that's why John even quotes Zechariah. If you look at verse 14 and 15 again, he says, As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on donkey's colt. Well, how did Jerusalem welcome Jesus? Look at verse 13. It says, people, they, they took branches of palm trees, and then they went out to meet Jesus at the gates of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem walls had gates. They stood there with their palm branches. See, the road that was leading from the city of Bethany to Jerusalem, it, it had palm trees. And people, hearing that Jesus is coming from Bethany, they went and they cut the branches down to hold it above Jesus' head as he would enter. Now, why would they do this? Well, I, I imagine that they did this to provide him shade. Israel has um, this climate that the sun could get really, really hot. And so they, I imagine them doing this to provide Jesus shade from the hot sun. And hence, Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem, it is famously known today as Palm Sunday. And some of you may have been in churches where you've actually um, participated in, in having palm branches on Palm Sundays, just to see how that would, that would feel and kind of have a, this visual experience where you, you can imagine how that was for Jesus. Now, according to Luke chapter 19, verse 36, the crowd also, uh, they eagerly carpeted the road by spreading their coats right before Jesus. Just like in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. Chapter 9, verse 13, they did this to proclaim Jesus as their new king. And furthermore, if you go back to John chapter 12, verse 13, we see that they joyfully began to shout. Does that sound familiar? They joyfully began to shout. What did Zechariah said? Rejoice. Shout in triumph. Here we see that they joyfully begin to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Wow. Now this word, Hosanna, it's the word that means do save us. Which, by the way, we started our service today in Psalm 118, verse 25. Hosanna, do save us, Lord. We beseech you. And so, these people in Jerusalem, they saluted Jesus as Israel's promised Messiah, as the son of David. And notice that Zechariah's prophecy was perfectly fulfilled. Perfectly fulfilled. Oh, that day, there was great excitement, there was great joy, there was praising of God. Remember when the Son of God came to this world, came to this earth, when He came being born in the flesh? In Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, uh, we saw how the angels announced to the shepherds, good news of great joy which will be for all people. Well, now Jesus arriving in Jerusalem, suddenly we see this whole crowd surrounded him, this massive crowd being overwhelmed with this great joy. The righteous king endowed with salvation has finally come. He will deliver his people and his kingdom. It will be eternal. But unlike the Israelites expected, his deliverance will not be political in nature. His salvation will not be accomplished through overthrowing the Roman government. No, it will be accomplished through 
being sacrificed as the Lamb of God, dying for sinners. He will deliver all of his people. He will save his church, which consists of both Jews and Gentiles. And his salvation, his kingdom, it will have an eternal sense. Now because of this, these same people that were lauding him today as their king, once they realize that Jesus is not overthrowing the Roman Empire, just days later, these same people will yell to Pilate, the Roman official, they will demand him to be crucified. They will scream, crucify him, crucify him. But that too was according to God's redemptive plan. Uh, this is part of what God had designed from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, it fulfilled God's promise which was made through Zechariah. And it confirmed him to be that righteous king endowed with salvation who humbled himself and came to establish his kingdom. And as the Gospels record, uh, the, the, humili the humiliation, the humility of Jesus, it continued. After he rode in on a donkey, it continued with, days later, his betrayal, his arrest, then the sham trial that he had to face, then the sentencing, being condemned as a blasphemer, and then the beatings and the execution on the cross, which we'll hear about this coming Friday, Lord willing. Oh, no one in Israel anticipated the Messiah's entrance to be a tragedy exactly as Zechariah foretold. See, Jesus, he went to Jerusalem knowing exactly what would take place, and he still went. He still went. And as an eternal glorious king, he was willing to suffer. He was willing to die for us. But Jesus' death, it was not the end. Three days later, he will rise again. He will give us a preview of the glory that all of his people will experience in the future. Oh, church. Church, blessed is Jesus who entered Jerusalem. He is the king of Israel who came to save all of his people from their sins. He's clothed with divine He's clothed with divine authority. He, he was commissioned by his heavenly father. Let us praise him. Let us worship him. He is blessed forever. And as his people, oh, we must worship him. We must bow down to him. We must exalt him throughout our lives. Not only with our mouths, with our thoughts, with our deeds. If Jesus was willing to suffer and die for us, and he was willing, how can we then shrink back from serving him in ways that we're capable of doing? If he has died for us, why can't we willingly do what he has gifted us to do for the sake of his glory, for the sake of his kingdom? If he saved us for his glory... How can we not pursue holiness? How can we not live a life that honors him as our king? We say that Jesus is king. Does our life testify of that? That he rules our life? Have we set our minds on the things above? Or have we still... Do we still have our gaze here on this earth? Do we remember this heavenly scene that John records for us in Revelation? For example, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 12. Now listen to this. John chapter 7, verse 9 through 12. John here records. If you're a believer, listen. This is for you. 
after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and people and, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cry out with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their face before the throne and worshipped God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is what awaits all born again Christians who have been saved by the righteous King. How amazing it will be when we will be finally in Jesus' glorious presence. But also, Remember that the Messiah who once humbly rode in on a donkey to die as the suffering servant, he will one day arrive on a white horse as the supreme sovereign king to conquer his enemies and to gloriously reign in Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 through 16 says, And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, they were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe, and on his tie he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Question, are you ready to meet your king face to face? Are you ready for Jesus to arrive again in Jerusalem? Are you a citizen of his kingdom? Now, if you are poor in spirit, then know that Jesus brought good tidings to his people. But if you're a slave of sin, then know that he's the one who came and proclaimed freedom to the captives. He came to set the prisoner free. If you're spiritually blind, believe that Jesus could give you spiritual sight. He comforts those who are bruised. He comforts those who are afflicted. Jesus came to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Throughout our service, there were many songs that we sang that invited you to come to Christ. Come to Him today. Repent of your unbelief. Repent of your rebellion. And in faith, Submit to him as King of kings, Lord of lords. May the Lord cause today to be the day of, of your salvation. And beloved, may the Holy Spirit work in all of our hearts so that each one of us could know how to praise, how to glorify Jesus as our divine, eternal King. If you're willing and able, can I ask you to please rise? Oh, Father, we thank you that you have given us this reminder of how our Jesus, our Lord, how he entered Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 
Jesus, you are the king of Israel. And your kingdom stretches out all throughout the nations. We thank you that you have come to save your church. And we thank you, Lord, that you're always faithful to your promises. Lord, as we contemplate this entrance, this glorious fulfillment of, of prophecy and the proof that you are the Messiah, the promised one, may it encourage us to faithfully submit to you, to trust your word in everything, knowing that even if it doesn't make sense to us at the moment, we can still trust and rely on it because you're faithful to fulfill everything you promise. Bless us, Lord, as we think this week about all that you went through in your redemption of us sinners. And may you receive all the glory and honor. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah.
Praise the Lord. Let us have one more prayer. Dear Lord God Almighty, thank you for this reminder of the greatness of you as king, the righteousness and full of salvation and also humble. May this week, may we have somber thoughts about the purpose of the suffering and pain that your son went through. May we think about the why and how does that relate to me, to each of us. That we would honor you and praise you for the gift of life given because your son died for us. We thank you and we praise you, and it is in the name of Jesus Christ, Almighty King, that I pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week.